Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, on uh, Sunday afternoon, choosing to spend time listening to me talk about fish. Um, <laughs> I will be talking about for the next uh, few minutes uh, about urban political ecologies on the edge and their implications for our understanding about cities, nature, and politics through the particular histories and geographies um, of Manila and surrounding areas. So whenever I talk about this book, I always begin with socio-ecological stories from across the urban edge. So the first one is a story about floods. On the morning of September 26, some 13 years ago, residents of a significant portion of Metro Manila woke up to a sudden surge of floodwaters. This, after hours of nonstop rain, drenched much of the city, dumping a month's worth of monsoon rains over a six-hour period. Manila's waterways failed to contain the excess stormwater from upstream, forcing their banks and unexpectedly inundating homes with water and mud. Metro Manila has been routinely flooded throughout its urban history, and people have learned to expect and live around such a hazard. However, the scale of the damage this time was unprecedented. While images of catastrophe in the city circulated and dissipated over the next few days, those who lived along the shoreline of Laguna Lake, or Laguna Dubai, as it is also called, located to the city southeast, had to endure flooding for several weeks. Water that the city did not accommodate in the system of waterways had been diverted to the lake, which rose to levels not seen in these four decades. The lake's forgotten role in Metro Manila's flood control scheme as storage space for active storm water seeped into the public imagination again as explanations for both the disaster and the solutions to avert future flash flooding required considering the central place of the lake in making and maintaining urban flood control infrastructure that keeps the city dry. Uh, the second story is about fish. In 2013, a lakeside town from Manila Southeast celebrated its annual fiesta by hosting an unusual culinary contest. Competing chefs were tasked to create recipes for night fish, an exotic freshwater fish that had accidentally found its way into the lake from urban aquariums. The carnivorous predator posed a serious threat to commercial aquaculture in the lake, an industry introduced four decades earlier to improve fish production and meet urban demand for cheap protein. Aquaculture enclosures eventually took hold in the lake's landscape, a contentious and sometimes violent process, and established a lake economy that supplied fish to the urban markets. The highly invasive night fish became a costly pest for many of these aquaculture producers wiping out stock farm fish inside the enclosures and undermining a productive fishery. So the, this culinary contest was one of several attempts by the government to contain the invasion and reduce night fish population. It sought to show that the fish was edible to a skeptical public wary of consuming an unfamiliar fish. The winning dish pictured here, night fish a la cordon bleu, showed that transcending the undesirability of its bland flesh and elevating its edibility required some practical and imaginative work. Fishers caught the invasive fish, making do with what was available in the lake, ecologically transformed by the boom and bust cycles of urban aquaculture. But due to the lack of demand in the lake, the fish had to be brought to the city where its white flesh found use in the processing of urban street food. The exotic night fish presented an, a rather unintended species to farm fish from aquaculture deliberately introduced to improve the livelihoods of lake dwellers supply fish for the city. That both types of fish, one an invasive pest and the other a farm commodity, ended up consumed as food in Manila shows the close and changing social ecological relation between the city and the lake and urban provision. As urban social ecological stores beyond the city, the problem of floods and fish exposed urban connections that have been slowly built uh, and maintained over time. Uh, this as cities expand their edges and remove resources from elsewhere. Urban environmental trajectories are tied to their frontiers to a process that reconstitutes both urban and new spaces, ecology, and lives. And this is a story that I wish to explore in my book. Taking the question of urban provisioning and what kinds of work are necessary to make and maintain locations, I drew from diverse range of approaches in urban environmental and uh, agrarian studies to cast light on urbanization as a frontier making process one that brings together nature's landscapes, peoples across space, and finding geographical solutions to urban resource challenges. These beyond the city spaces like the unique 
A Laguna Lake are made to work to deliver vital resource flows that sustain city life. Um, Manila, with its extended metropolitan population of more than 25 million, has been particularly plagued by two persistent environmental challenges amid its growth. One is feeding its appetite for food and water, and the other is keeping it safe from the threat of flooding, both of which underscore its intensified dependence on resource flows beyond boundaries. More a bit about Manila. It's the second largest megacity in Southeast Asia, a watery city. It sits on a narrow stretch of coastal, alluvial, and pretty volcanic land with water on two sides. To the west is Manila Bay, a historically and economically important body of water that has linked the former colonial capital with the rest of the world for centuries. Uh, it is bisected by the passing Maritina Rivers, uh, the main arteries of the city, which link uh, Manila Bay with other water bodies in Southeast, the Luna Lake or the Luna Dubai, which we will talk more about in a bit. So these waterways connect to the Sierra Madre Mountains to the east where much of the water uh, flows from and has been the subject of interventions for uh, nearly a century. Manila's uh, metropolitan area has experienced tremendous growth over the past half century, expanding to all, all areas uh, where it can. The spatially fragmented and highly unequal character of the city has also been reproduced in areas on edges. Areas characterized by the easy juxtaposition of rural farmers with suburban elite enclaves, middle class residents, resettlement housing for those affected from the city, and recent migrants living in former settlements. So, one such edge to think of is uh, Laguna Lake, a 900 square kilometer shallow and nutrient rich freshwater lake became an important node in state development project designs. So one can say that the state imagined its unique resource frontier, a ready source of fish and domestic water and sink for waste and flood waters. As this particular frontier developed, techniques of simplifying, erasing, and recounting complex with social ecologies intersected with lake dwellers' practices of living and the increasing urban dimensions of transportation. Uh, the state, Philippine state, introduced aquaculture in 1970 for regional development while supplying steady flows of fish for a city amid crisis in captured fisheries. But this was not without contradiction as aquaculture's expansion marginalized fish for producers and exposed city consumers to cheaper and more abundant but less desirable and perhaps more unsafe fish. Um, managing the stormwater function of the lake to a flood control network enabled large scale control of flows to prevent flood flooding in the city, but channeled floods of the lake and magnified risk for the lake dwellers in their production. So, following both fish and flood waters makes visible assemblage of flows, landscapes, and infrastructures, the conditions of possibility of sustained life in the city, uh, most dynamically found in and beyond what you can call the urban edge. So I use the term edge here uh, as it invokes uh, these three meanings that capture a sense of peripherality in terms of allocation, relation, and condition. As a location, uh, it may refer to the urban fringe, the zone where the city dissolves into the beyond the city. Uh, as more of a continuum, this is often considered as gradual, patchwork, ambiguous, shaped by a mix of multiple logics and characterized by unpredictable juxtaposition. Uh, Laguna Lake sits on Metro Manila's expanded edge, with the city literally stopping at the lake shore, even as urban connections, flows, and in impacts extend well beyond. As a relation, the edge also denotes limits, transitions, and liminality of being wedged between two worlds, in between the core and margins, the city and the frontier, reflects a relation manifested in particular times and places, suggesting that the fate of places like Laguna Lake in Manila are related, connected to urbanization. As a condition of uncertainty, precarity, and being unsettled, the edge also suggests socio-ecological relations marked by shifts and surprises. There's a looming sense of being on the precipice of transforming into a different state and a sense of undecidability and visionality. Urban frontier making and living lakes were visions of space and material transformation, reconfigure so precarious lives and landscapes and redefine trajectories and often unexpected ways. So before returning to uh, Laguna Lake and Metro Manila, allow me to say a bit more about two core concepts that I found useful in guiding uh, the book's framing, uh, which are frontier and concept of frontier and concept of traveling.
Okay, so the frontier opens up possibilities for relationally understanding urban spaces transformed beyond the city. Uh, we know that frontiers are historically and geographically specific, and they denote dynamic spatiality, producing the relational center as something that is spatial according to uh, geographers. The frontiers are mutable and mobile, they emerge and vanish, they need to turn, and frontier making is uh, the term that captures this relational dynamism. On the other hand, these are frontiers signal the creative and destructive incorporation of margins into the orbit of state and capital, emerging as particular moments when a new resource becomes amenable to extraction and commodification. So there are sites where state territorial power, modern visions of order, and capital accumulation intersect with lives and landscapes, leaving, producing spaces of conflict, change, challenges. The anthropologist and Singh identified a few of their features as imaginative or discursive constructions, liminal or contact zone of the not yet, as unmapped or characterized by erasures, and as lively, meaning populated with lives, livelihood, and liveliness. So I use all of these to guide the narrative on the lakes, a frontier making narrative. So there is a wealth of work on frontiers and resource frontiers in uh, rural, agrarian, and terrestrial um, political ecological research across the world. Urbanization, however, has uh, often been overlooked in accounts of frontier making, um, but they can be mapped onto each other as relations of uh, co constituted by resource production flows. An urban resource frontier promises progress and development, achieved through increased integration with the city to solve these resource problems, um, often facilitated by state forms of territorialization. So, the, the concept of resource flows uh, here is vital to understanding connection between. These two spaces, frontier and city. So I found urban metabolism as a concept particularly useful um, as a boundary concept in the natural and social sciences. Uh, it, it's often used to refer to social ecological transformation in the city. In the fields of industrial ecology and other sustainability approaches, urban metabolism is understood as supplied by flows of materials and energy from outside needed for a city's function, functioning. Can think of input output systems with uh, resources and wastes. And the goal of such an accounting and systems approach is to measure resource flows, stocks, to plan for urban sustainability, climate change, and global environment change. So here's an example of such an accounting in uh, supply to Metro Manila um, in a kind of a diagram for measuring flows of um, resources and wastes. However, critical urban scholars have also pointed out that these flows and circulation uh, also bear histories, practices, and progressive politics, um, often exceeding the spatial boundedness of cities uh, as understood in the systems approach we showed earlier. So the field of urban political ecology, or for short, has cast attention to social relations surrounding major cities, including such resource, resource flows that operate with increasingly planetary reach. UPE um, deploys a historicized understanding of urban metabolism, primarily drawing from Marxist notions of the term. Metabolism becomes a metaphor for the material and symbolic transfer of cities, um, also pertaining to the co constitution of social labor and material processes framed in within capitalist urbanization. As the pioneering uh, work of Eric Sumidao argued, nature and cities are understood as co produced rather than distinct entities that are often examined. Separate. Um, and of course, there are political implications for such an approach. It is concerned with transforming unjust urban relations by seeking to reveal what is hidden in capitalist urbanization nature and the questions of control and access to metabolic flows. Uh, another key feature that separates UPE from perhaps other Marxist inspired urban ecological works focused on hybridity and the bringing together of heterogeneous actors and objects in urban co-production. So one example is flow, and it becomes an important metaphor to describe metabolism spatial dynamics. Um, it implies fluidity, movement, circulation, and that these are not merely quantifiable in physical objects, but are constituted relations. Uh, Swing it out terms them as forms of metabolized hybrid social natures, and flows of water, for example, uh, have been a main concern for UPE's urban metabolism narratives with some classic work like Murray Python's City Flows, uh, Dao's own work on uh, Ecuador in Ecuador and Spain, and uh, Matthew Bell's work on New York. 
and they try to argue how various forms of urban politics often coalesce around questions of uneven access and use of water in the city. Uh, but here I focus on two other types of flows uh, that are often not examined in, in urban urbanology, food and floods. Um, food is metabolized through practices and work at different sites, as mentioned on the city, encountered as commodity, it transforms people's relationship with nature. Uh, flood or storm water is another example of a flow managed because it presents risk to urban population. Uh, often expelled and controlled to integrate infrastructural services with the built environment. So I hope to show that uh, how a metabolic lens uh, illustrates how urbanization assembles diverse things, relations, and politics in making and maintaining particular socio-ecological relations across space and illustrating that cities are always coarse places in the nature. And when I talk about urban ecologies, I also draw from uh, kind of broader debates that seek to disentangle what constitutes the ecological or the natural. Um, social natural hybridity presents to be an approach that emphasizes the active role of those who term as natural in making histories and geographies with uh, the hybrid cyborg metaphor of cities bringing together non dualist views of nature society. Pain here is that. Um, cities do not just have an ecological dimension, but are constituted by transformations that go through the social natures of both uh, cities and concrete spaces. Um, urban metabolic flows are also mediated by infrastructure as a social technical, technical element of urban fabric. Um, it facilitates bringing resource flows to the city and within it, it connects the city with the country and sustain them. As network infrastructure will evolve alongside urban forms, they serve as sites within which contested politics and struggles for access to space. And we know from the, from the literature and urban infrastructure that they produce complex ecologies in the process of serving as underlying mechanism that enables, enables the circulation of things. In many ways, they are considered as uh, paradoxical. Urban ecologies are also lived and experienced and situated within particular conjunctures. Here, the everyday becomes a site of social ecological change. Flows, uh, for instance, may be reframed as constituted by ordinary practices of doing that produce space and power, such as in mundane acts of buying, using fish, or dealing with hazards. So these mundane acts of doing rework the urban environment and sustain these relations. So having had that out of the way, so let's return to the Day. Um, and its historical production of the particular urban uses might here. In 1966, legislation passed for the creation of the Laguna Lake Development Authority, or the LDA, to oversee development of the lake in the wake of post independence state building in the Philippines. It was a dream waiting to be realized. The grand vision involved uh, promoting growth by reordering lake nature and its governance through infrastructure and social development projects two of which were particularly important. One was the control of water, and the other the production of more fish. Both involved understanding the lake's close connections with natural Manila. Laguna Lake has long been a productive fishery, mostly of low-value fish for local consumption. The lake's uh, very high productivity owes to its unique mineralogical condition, where the natural abundance of nutrients in the shallow lake allows for year-long availability of plankton, that serves as feed for the lake fauna. Intensification of fishing pressure in the 1950s led to the near collapse of the once vibrant and diverse capture fishery in the lake. And this became a justification for introducing better techniques for fish production that supposedly will harness more efficiently the lake's natural boundary. Thus, aquaculture was introduced in 1970, and various experiments were conducted to try to adapt to the new conditions and location of the lake. By the early 1980s, the fishery min fisheries minister was quoted as saying that the lake was transformed from a near barren lake to a productive one, the country showcased in aquaculture technology. By this time, the lake had supplied 80% of freshwater fish uh, in Metro Manila and 30% of the country countries. Aquaculture's productivity at times was more than three times that of captive fisheries. This was due to higher yields without the use of artificial feeds and technological innovation in the production technique and the fish body itself. However, owing to its dependence on natural plankton presence in the lake, 
control of water quality needed to become an important concern for fisheries and overall development. Infrastructural control of water became important in attempts to make the lake perform its water resource work. So we have salt water coming from Manila Bay to the Pasig River, it cuts to the city uh, in central Metro Manila, which needs to be controlled to prevent backflow that contains excess nutrients that both sustains the lake's uh, productivity, but also causes periods of fish mortalities, fish kills. So fisheries depended on this salt water intrusion for containing production, but state authorities and consultants uh, that time saw its control as vital in delivering development of the lake and ensuring its resource functioning for urban needs. A hydraulic control structure, as seen here on the right, was built for this purpose, which has since become a site of infrastructural policies in the lake. Um, aquaculture's production has led to significant transformation of the lake's irrigations. Fish pens owned by uh, large fishing corporations and wealthy individuals based in Metro Manila, and which tend to encompass hundreds or even thousands of hectares of lake space, were established in the middle of the lake's most productive parts of the lake, where capture fisher folks still made a living using various gear. In the 1980s, a smaller version of the fish pen, the half a hectare, Fish cage was pilot tested and eventually became an option for less capitalized fisher folk to embark on aquaculture. Together, um, these production systems still coexist, and if you go to the lake, you will still see these three modes of production, and they uh, coexist in conflict in the lake given their own particular relation to production and ecological specificities. Aquaculture transformed the kinds of fish produced in the lake. As you know, farm fish eventually. Uh, replaced indigenous species, uh, which continue to decline over the years. The most significant issue, however, has been the contentious state over fish pens over the lake's landscape during starting during the fish pen rush of the 1970s. By the early 1980s, close to half of the lake, as seen here on this map, uh, was occupied by fish pens, whose absentee owners hired caretakers and armed guards stationed in these isolated huts to watch over highly valued fish. These created tense conditions in the lake that uh, erupted in occasional bouts of violence. Money came quickly during the initial fish pen rush. Fish pens were so profitable, drawing from the so-called free gifts of plankton and cheap labor that they could recover investments after just one harvest. But this increasingly became difficult with the expansion of fish pen area and overcrowding and the practice of overfeeding, which ironically slow down growth due to excessive nutrient load in the water. The need to intensify production in aquaculture amid such difficult ecological conditions in the lake caused its own uh, downfall in productivity over the succeeding years. State, <clears throat> the state eventually took steps to rein in such frontier chaos uh, and it could be forms. The first one is uh, rationalization, which entailed territorial regulation to zoning of belts of aquaculture use and to occasional demolition. The second one is in the form of democratization, which entailed building fisher folk capacity as cooperatives to manage fish pens, which tends to be a higher capital and knowledge uh, venture. Both strategies, however, were routinely failures, uh, routine failures through the decades, owing to a variety of reasons, such as the strong political clout of fish pen owners and their ability to circumvent uh, regulation. So from the frontier, let me shift gears and talk more about the connections and bring the story beyond the lake and trace its connections to the city by following the flows of fish. Um, so understanding these metabolic flows as part of the social material enables seeing multiple relations to various nodes from the lake at the site of production to the urban fish markets, the site of exchange, to homes and streets, the sites of consumption bring together people's places, relations, the everyday practices, of course, underscoring questions of power, access, and other stories of bringing these flows. So marine fish still account for uh, most of the fish landed and consumed in the city, currently around 70%. Uh, but Laguna Lake plays a significant role in supplying much of freshwater fish consumed in French Manila. This is especially important considering the crisis in marine fisheries in archipelagic Philippines, where traditional staples such as brown stat or golungkong, known as the poor man's fish, have become relatively expensive and are now being imported. Um, 
Aquaculture is often framed as a substitute for solution to crisis in wild and marine fisheries due to the greater degree of control and production. In this regard, Laguna Lake fisheries accounts for much farm fish consumption in the city, despite it uh, not being the preferred fish and fetching the lowest price in the markets. This emphasis on cheap fish is important as much as much of the urban population of the uh, particular income class in Metro Manila, accounting for around three fourths of the city's population, rely on fish as their primary source of protein um, more than other kinds of meat. You can actually show the uh, kind of the, the value chain of Laguna Lake fish from sites of inputs uh, to production in the lake, the exchange and consumption in the city. And each of these, of course, would have their own stories and complex social and economic relations built over successive encounters and transactions. If you're interested in tracking power and money in these nodes, this will take us to two important nodes, the, the fish trends mentioned earlier, and the brokers in the city's largest fish market. In many cases, these are owned by the same corporations or families, uh, but together they exert considerable control and influence in the flows of fish from decisions of how much and when to harvest, to questions of storage, auctioning, and consignment in the fish market. So this is the, the Botas fish port, uh, currently the second biggest uh, fish market in the Philippines in terms of unloading, but historically, this has been the most important fish market in Metro Manila. So every day, half a million tons of fish pass through the market. This is where Laguna Lake fish and other marine fish are unloaded in the city. And as a site, this is highly secured and often subject to surveillance as millions of vessels worth of fish are exchanged nightly. Many of these fishing corporations coincidentally use the Guna Lake fish through their pen operations as a way to stabilize production, especially during the lunar months uh, in the north, uh, northeast monsoon months later in the year. They employ hundreds of laborers in here who come from the nearby informal settlements. And there is a whole host of relations involved between brokers, workers, and fish. Work is on a contractual daily basis, involving up to uh, eight hour shifts in the middle of the night with high risk of accidents as they need to work fast and efficiently with fluctuating fish prices. So um, these brief examples shows how fish flows are active sites of co-production to labor practical activity along the urban value chain. And decisions about the chain are often held at key points to various exercises of control in both formal and informal ways. So another way of thinking about social natural co production, uh, urban metabolic flows, is to track uh, the so called biographies of uh, cheap fish for the city. Here we can use the curious case of the big head carp, historically and unfamiliar to the taste of many Filipinos but it's now ranked as the fifth most produced farm fish in the world after uh, three other Asian carps and the Nile tilapia. In many places where they are farmed for food, such as in China, or where they have escaped as invasive, such as in the United States, they have uh, had their own fascinating stories. In Laguna Lake, uh, the fish came to be known under multiple names, including Taiwan, which suggests its geographical pathway to the lake when it was introduced in the 1970s. It is also called Imelda, named after the former first lady uh, of Marcos, who was considered responsible for introducing to several other water bodies in the country. So we see from this graph how Big Head Carp or Imelda has comprised a significant portion of fish production from the lake since then. But this is not necessarily something that fish producers planned or wanted. Big head carp fetches the lowest farm gate price among all fish produced in lake elsewhere in the Philippines. However, there are a few characteristics that make it, in certain times, a good choice for producers, uh, including its tolerance for poor water conditions, unlike uh, the third but more sensitive uh, milkfish or bamus. Uh, the lack of artificial feeding also makes it the cheapest fresh fish available in the city, but it is also often the last choice for urban fish consumers owing to it being bland fish sheep only. Thus, there are a few strategies that various urban fish value chain actors employ to sell, consume, or in short, metabolize flows of cheap fish from the lake. The first one here is chopping the fish body, uh, as seen in the wet markets. Fish vendors would chop the fish, remove the head, 
and present the fish unlabeled in order to distance the fish from its lake origins, which often comes with a negative connotation in terms of taste and quality. Retailers and vendors undertake these practices to make it resemble a much more desirable marine fish by calling it a uh, freshwater red snapper. Um, vendors and retailers also encourage fish consumers to buy the unfamiliar fish by suggesting various ways of cooking. So there are particular cooking methods suited to the blander flesh and the larger head, and a few more extra steps to get rid of the fishy taste, such as washing it with salt, soaking in ginger, and adding pandan leaves while cooking. The large head is often used in sinigang, which is a tamarind flavored sour and savory soup. And for a while, it became a cheaper substitute for salmon head um, until a cheap salmon head import flooded the Philippine market. Often used in Sinigang Samiso, which is a popular dish among seaside eaters in Metro Manila. So much of the consumers of big, big head carp tend to be the urban poor neighborhoods because it's cheap, particular, uh, creating a particular class connotation consumption. The fish is also consumed in processed form as fish balls, a popular street food in Manila, popular among the working class and consumed as an afternoon snack. It's bland white meat, as meat and uh, even cheaper alternative to the more expensive marine white fish ingredients, with trash marine fish that have become even more expensive. There is, however, a noticeable difference in the quality, the taste, and the appearance of fish balls produced with the dead carp, suggesting that the fish, uh, the fish's material characteristic tied to the taste, still surfaces despite attempts at erasing. These practices show the complexities of substituting wild fish with farm fish. Uh, it requires work in selecting, cooking, and consuming fish, and illustrates that food practices create work in gaining food provisioning as they pass through various hands and are encountered and transformed in multiple ways. In many ways, we're revising how we think about urban metabolism as a concept. Uh, to add to this big head carp story, we return to the knife fish uh, example introduced at the start of the presentation. It has provided an even cheaper white fish alternative than the big head carp, and many of the fishable manufacturers have shifted to night fish as an ingredient in their production. The carnivorous night fish can grow up to 10 kilos in weight, and its large mouth is able to eat all kinds of fish, most notably those farmed fish friends. At one point in the mid 2010s, it comprised 40% of fish caught by captured fishable. It is particularly a scourge for fish pen owners because once they get inside the enclosure, it's very difficult to remove them and they would eat and consume um, uh, kilos of stockfish every day. Thus, fish pens have developed entanglements with fisher folk long characterized as having antagonistic relations with whom they hire to catch uh, the fish and pay them for, um, for getting rid of night fish. The case of night fish also presents a case of uh, state and community action on unwant unwanted invasive species, including destroying the eggs, paying fisher folk to catch them and sell them to the government, and also encouraging their consumption by demonstrating that they could be made into things like hot dogs or dumplings or cooked using uh, familiar food methods. The emergence of such a fish in an urban resource frontier uh, shows uh, unexpected lives emerging in an environment heavily transformed amid what you can call the a space of the Anthropocene, the ecologies of the Anthropocene. But they also show processes of embedding into existing networks and reassembling arrangements of bodies and practices of making do and improvisation to the earth as the body flows. It's uh, so one other example, we turn to the metabolic story of floods, flood waters. Efforts to manage Manila's floods date back to the early years of the American colonial occupation and its ideal of the sanitary city faith in science and engineering in addressing urban problems. In this regard, Lagoon Lake played an important role in the scheme as where the water from upstream could be temporarily stored to avert flash flooding in the city. Beyond, city spaces like Lagoon Lake are crucial in function of this uh, flood control infrastructure. And in many ways, the lake itself functions as an infrastructure, a vital node in the engineering network. Uh, in a way, it's a condition that makes a dry city possible. Guided by two master plans, mid-century master plans, many of the structures in the network were built in the 1970s, 1980s, 
amid a centralized authoritarian rule driven by foreign borrowing and visions of infrastructure modernity. Together, they operate synchronistically so as to channel floods from one place to another, taking advantage of time lags and water volumes. They reflect, however, some form of risk transference as risk is displaced elsewhere or in the future, as in the case of flooding in Metro Manila since the 1970s. Infrastructure here becomes paradoxical in that it's built to manage risk, but produces new kinds of risk. This risk is also mobilized to achieve particular ends, serving as a justification for producing the lake as a space for recent production, as a separate space from the city where risk takes place. The state's response to flooding has primarily been to introduce more infrastructure well, interventions, while also identifying high-risk areas of populations that need to be evacuated and transferred as elsewhere. This maps onto the recent spate of evictions former settlements in Metro Manila identified as at, as at risk populations in danger zones and who are relocated in the peri-urban fringes with very little income opportunities and access to good services. And as this uh, example shows here, and uh, ironically, these places are more prone to flooding. The case of flows of flood waters between city and lake shows the importance of territorial imaginaries in the work of infrastructural maintenance. These forces reshape lives and livelihoods across the edge. Manila's flood control network is, in a way, paradoxical in that its construction embodies visions of progress and control, but it also symbolizes the failure to deliver on its promise. The symbolic power of its imprint on the landscape legitimizes the state, but often fades into the built environment, emerging only when it fails. Infrastructure aims to keep the city dry, but this requires channeling of harm elsewhere. Therefore, it does not merely bring resource flows to the city, but also produces and reproduces in these landscapes of risk and urban metabolic inequality. So in the last few uh, minutes, uh, let me conclude with some reflections on the features and temporalities of a particular urban fund, resource fund here like the UK. So what happens to a frontier transformed to deliver urban metabolic resource flows? In response to the floods that introduced this presentation, Philippine government promised an infrastructure solution in the form of an expressway dike that both aimed to address flooding while reclaiming more land for speculative urban development. These developments reflect, uh, reflect the ways that the lake is viewed to reconfigure lake environments to channel particular metabolic flows. And here, imaginaries of ruination, uh, decline, death, and decay have always been the a key feature of research frontiers as their productive capacities are exhausted or rendered obsolete. The imagination of the lake as dying, dead, polluted, and degraded uh, continues to circulate. The silted, murky brown lake, heavily transformed for decades by human activities, has become nothing but the utilitarian landscape of resource production. So these framings serve to justify mega projects like this dike, where it's been pushed through but was replaced by another, a different kind of project. Uh, and make these interventions less contentious. In contrast, lake dwellers continue to emphasize the lively, life-giving nature of the lake to oppose such projects. Ruination also serves a different political purpose in more recent sense as a technique to justify forms of authoritarian interventions. Reminiscent of the regime of the 1970s and early 1980s, the lake again became such a, a site in 2016 when it was a very strong Populist undertone, former president Rodrigo Duterte promised to bring the lake back to a past pristine state of bounty. He promised to bring order to the lake and restore it to its past ecological condition by uh, ordering the dismantling of agricultural structures that have long taken root in the lake and proposing non extractive ecotourism alternatives instead. This view, however, uh, undermines the complex relation that has been built to sustain a productive lake on which thousands of livelihoods. This as the government's infrastructure push, bringing golden age of infrastructure, uh, aims to solve many of Manila's metabolic problems by building more contentious infrastructure, including extracting domestic water from the lake and urban trees. The one promise of a metabolic lens to urban resource one years is that it extends to stuff of politics, taking us to various sites of dispossession and equality struggles. It entails including more political actors. Sites of intervention 
in the Asian scene. In 2021, at the height of pandemic lockdowns in the city, community pantries uh, like this one on the right began sprouting at, up at various street corners around uh, Metro Manila. Many of these uh, voluntary, voluntary driven community pantries aim to provide access to food for residents amid increasing hunger and a very restrictive lockdown. Fisher folk from Laguna Lake showed solidarity with urban dwellers by donating more than 50 kilos of fresh tilapia to a community pantry in Quezon City, serving an urban poor community. So this donation demonstrated the possibility of being able to supply fish from the lake, especially to those who are in need. But the Fisher folk group also emphasized the need for structural change and support in the production system to enable them to continue supplying food um, and the, labeling themselves as food security frontliners. The edges after all are sites where multiple eventualities emerge and diverge as urbanization rolls out temporarily with sometimes incomplete and undecidable trajectories. These are edges are also vital grounds for forging political possibilities as people attend to their livelihood needs. To diverse rhythms of practices, such as in the patchwork, battle with indigenous uh, urban frontiers. Which today I hope to show um, my work are productive sites from which to think in the making and remaking of cities, uh, frontiers, and their ecology. Thank you very much for the